Hi, I'm Dylan, and you're listening to the Animals at Home podcast. Welcome to the first episode of the Animals at Home podcast. So if you're not familiar with who I am, my name is Dylan, and I currently have a YouTube channel and a blog that goes by the name of Animals at Home. And the purpose of this podcast is to unite everybody who has a passion for animals under one platform so we can learn from each other, so we can share ideas, so we can see a different perspective. I think that's really important because quite often there's a sort of a divide that gets put up between people who are, for example, in the hobbyist pet industry and people who are in the, we'll say, the academic and wildlife industry. Now, those are two very separate industries, but at the same time, It all revolves around this deep passion for animals that I think I can speak for everybody when I say that passion was something that just developed as a small child. Somewhere along the line, we all develop the same thing. And and different life paths take you down maybe the hobbyist side or the wildlife conservation academic side. But at the end of the day, I think we have a lot more in common with each other and a lot more to learn from each other than quite often is made out to be. So here's what you can expect on this show. The podcast will feature three main guest archetypes. The first will be animal owners. So these are the individuals that are inside the pet trade. So maybe they are breeders or just owners of large collections or something along those lines. The second are animal researchers. So those that are in the academic field that are striving to discover new scientific fact about the animals that we care about. And the third group is the wildlife conservationists. So this is a group of individuals who maybe work for a charity or a foundation and who are striving to protect the animals and the land that is currently at risk of being wiped off the planet. By providing plenty of engaging and interesting content, my goal with the podcast is threefold. The first is to encourage hobbyists to participate in conservation efforts. In my opinion, introducing people to new facts and scientific research about the animals that they love and care about is the best way to encourage everybody to help participate in protecting our planet. And the second is to educate. Now, I'm an intensely curious person, and I also feel like I know absolutely nothing about animals. Despite knowing a fair bit, I'm always wanting to know more. And so maybe this goal is slightly more self-interest based, but, but I especially want to help educate or spark an interest in the younger generation of kids who have an interest in either the pet hobby or animals in general, and to inspire them to start thinking about what future role they might play in animal welfare. And the third is, of course, to entertain. I want to provide interesting and entertaining content for those of us who just want to learn more about the creatures we share the earth with. So if you are an animal enthusiast and you're as obsessed with animals as I am, I think you're really going to love this show. So before we get into that exciting stuff, I figured I would set this episode up to be a lot less of a first episode and a lot more of a introduction to the podcast slash introduction to myself. I think it's really important that if I'm going to be hosting a show that I give you guys some background on who I am so you have a little more of a framework of where I'm coming from when I'm asking questions to other people. And if you've watched any of my YouTube videos, you know that I basically don't divulge any personal information on my channel. I I might not even have my name mentioned in any of my channels. So we're going to start right there. My name is Dylan, as I said earlier in the podcast, and I'd like to tell you the story of how my passion for animals has grown and developed over my lifetime. I live in Manitoba, Canada, so if you're not aware of where Manitoba is, it's one of the center provinces in Canada. If you live in the United States, I basically live directly north of North Dakota. So I do live very far up north. If you watch any of my YouTube videos, you will hear me complain about my weather from time to time because I have very volatile weather to deal with. In the winters, it's minus 40 degrees Celsius. In the summers, it's plus 30 degrees Celsius. So I have a giant spectrum of temperatures and humidity. In the winter, the humidity is basically zero. And in the summer, it can be upwards of 80. So I have this kind of fluctuation of climate that I deal with on an annual basis. So that always poses a few issues when you're taking care of you know, you know tropical reptile species. So once in a while, you hear me complain about that. I grew up in the country. So I grew up in a very small town on a farm. And I think that's really where my passion for animals started to develop initially. We had an emu farm for a while, which if you don't know what an emu is, it's a giant flightless bird. They're about five feet tall. They're from Australia. We had a hundred or so on our property uh, when I was a younger kid. And living in the country, you interact with a lot of different wildlife. There's a lot of benefits to living in the country. 
And of course, living on a farm, you have your revolving door of cats and dogs, which are always great. But we also had an in-ground pool. And if you have an in-ground pool, maybe this happens to you, but every time it rained in the morning, I'd come out to the pool and there would be frogs and toads all over the tarp. I'm not sure why they would always fall into the pool over the nighttime. Luckily, there's a tarp down so they can, they're just kind of sitting on the top of the tarp, not drowning or anything. But I would always catch frogs. So where I'm from, there's leopard frogs, wood frogs, and also gray tree frogs. And the gray tree frogs are super neat because they're also sometimes like a lime green. Uh, so those are always fun. And, you know, sometimes I'd capture them and make a makeshift terrarium and bring them inside, which my mom did not like because sometimes they escaped. At this, this is early 2000s, so there's essentially no usable internet or care sheets or anything. So I'd often catch these things and keep them for a day or two and then release them because I had no idea how to care for them. And I actually do remember at one point my brother and I each caught, our, caught ourselves a garter snake and I remember going to the garage. We, we weren't allowed to keep them in the house but we went to our garage and we set up this 50 gallon fish tank with some sticks and a little terrarium with a heat lamp and, and again there's no idea of how to care for these animals and I actually think it may be illegal because I don't think you're allowed to keep native animals in captive or, or native animals in captivity where I'm from. I, I think that's true so we may have been breaking the law without realizing it. But anyway, in the country, I guess you just do whatever you want. And we had these snakes in this 50-gallon uh, enclosure. And I was so disappointed because I, when I woke up the next morning, they were both did they both disappeared. And at the time, I was very confused about how they must have got out. But now that I own snakes, I realized that they would have easily got out. We didn't even have a lid on the, on the uh, aquarium. So obviously, they just slithered out and, and went on their merry way. So even as a young child, I was always trying to interact with animals in any way I could. And, and part of the con, I guess, of living inside in, in the country is that I essentially had no TV. So we had one channel on our TV, which is CBC. That's the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And there wasn't really much on that channel, nothing to watch anyway, because I really wanted to watch Discovery Channel. I always, my friends at school who had satellite always talked about Discovery Channel, and I was always so jealous of them. And uh, I remember at one point my my parents' family's friend had on a VHS recorded like 20 or 30 episodes of Zabumafu. So I don't know if you know what Zabumafu is, but it was a kid's show and it was with the Krat brothers, Chris and Martin, and there was this little lemur puppet that would, it was like maybe 20 or 30 minutes, and, and we, they would always talk about a new animal and we you'd learn about just basic facts about these animals. And, and I, I remember being obsessed with the, that show. I just could not get enough of it. So I think all of those experiences together, you know, catching wildlife frogs and, and being around the farm and watching Zabumafu and things like that, I think I think all that started to blossom up this passion for animals that I just always had. You know, not everybody has that, and, and it's hard to put into words, but I don't think I need to put it into words because I'm guessing you have the same type of passion, whether it be just watching the animals or caring for the animals or watching a show about animals. I mean, how many times have you watched Animal Planet, or not Animal Planet, um, Animal Planet used to be good, but um, Planet Earth, that's what I mean. Planet Earth is unbelievable, especially those when those first came out, it was just like jaw-dropping. You could not get enough of it, or at least I couldn't. And I remember even being in grade 2 or grade 3, when people would ask me what I wanted to do when I grew up, I would always say scientist. And what I meant by scientist was somebody who researched animals. And that did not end up happening, and I'll get into that why that didn't happen, but it just shows from a, at such a young age, my obsession with animals has, has always been there. So I think my first real pet, a pet that was my responsibility, besides some goldfish that we had, were two rats. So if you've not had rats as a pet before, you're really missing out because they're brilliant pets, especially for kids. They're very easy to care for and they are so social. They love to play, they love to come out and, and they're very interactive and, and I, I remember really enjoying enjoying those animals and, and that was kind of my first sense of having responsibility for caring for my own animal and then after that I sort of had a you know you end up getting a ton of different pets throughout the years although at this point I must have been maybe 10 or 11 with when I had the rats and I wasn't really interested in reptiles so much but I ended up getting some budgies budgies are a classic pet for kids they're a little bit noisy and messy but uh, they were another awesome awesome animal and and after the budgies, I went down the fish slash aquarium path. So, so that really snowballs fast. If you've ever been in the aquarium hobby, I remember someone gave me a fish bowl for free. And I was like, oh, I'll just go get a betta fish. And then 
And I thought, oh, I don't want just a betta fish, so I'll go buy a 10-gallon tank. And then I went to Walmart, and this time I knew very little about taking care of fish. I went, I went to Walmart, bought a 10-gallon tank, and did the mistake that everybody makes the first time. And they sold me a bunch of fish, and of course, I think they all died because I, I didn't cycle the water properly. And it was like the fish that shouldn't have been in a 10-gallon tank. I remember having some ballast sharks and things that grew to like you know, five or six or seven inches inside this really small tank. It was really dumb, but obviously I learned a lot from that experience. And then, then I established a good kind of community tropical fish tank, a 10 gallon tank. And then that went to a 30 gallon tank. And then I found the African cichlids, which I really loved. And so I sold off my 30 gallon tank and bought a 75 gallon tank and, and then had this, you know, a, a pretty nice Afri- mixed African cichlid tank and I had that for years and then at and then at the time I was in an apartment and then one morning the the glass cracked on the bottom it was a sort of a long story of how that happened but essentially one of my filters one of the outputs from my filters a hose got bumped and it was then it started leaking out onto the stand that the fish tank was on which was fa- fine I didn't see that as a big problem I fixed the hose and went back to normal but the sand, the stand that was the fish tank was on got so wet that when it dried, it warped and then eventually just cracked the bottom of the tank, just a hairline crack. So I remember one day I did a water change and I was watching a movie. And by the end of the movie, the fish tank was like a centimeter or so down than when I had just filled it two hours before. So it's like, oh my God, the, the fish tank cracked. And luckily I had someone come out and help me and they took all my fish away and they gave me a couple bucks for them. But that was the sort of the end of my, my fish hobby. I would love to get back into it one day. So after I was done with my fish, I got into reptiles. And the way I got into reptiles was a little bit, I guess, weird. At this time, I I must have been about 16 years old. And I was walking through the grocery store with my mom, and they they were selling a bunch of these little Venus fly traps. I don't know if sometimes in the summertime here, there's always, the grocery stores always have Venus fly traps. I'm not exactly sure why. Maybe, Maybe your grocery stores do as well. But I remember just thinking, oh my God, this is so cool. So we bought it. It was just a couple bucks, whatever. And I think everybody who buys those, those things kill them eventually because they, they don't do well. Well, you can't have them outside here in the summer. You can, but in the winter they would die. And the plant itself needs to go into a dormancy period, which I don't think anybody does. And it it needs to have a high humidity. Anyway, long story short, I got this, I got this plant and then I looked into kind of how to care for it. And I realized like, wow, it actually really should be in some kind of terrarium that provides the humidity and the heat that it needs. And And then I went down this path of looking into different plant terrariums. And I still remember watching this video. It was an e-how video. I don't know if you've ever watched any of these e-how videos. And most of the ones that the e-how videos about pets, the advice is usually pretty bad in my experience. But I do remember watching this, this guy set up a terrarium and he did the whole, you know, the clay balls and the screen and the soil. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. I really want to do it. And I remember the last thing he said was, and now that your terrarium's set up, uh, if you wanted to add an animal like an amphibian or, or a gecko or a lizard or something, you could definitely do that. And I was like, oh my God, you shouldn't have said that because now I really want to do that. And I end up just letting the Venus flytrap, actually the Venus flytrap eventually died, a classic, but I didn't end up putting it in a terrarium. But then that's, you know, sent me down the path of just researching reptiles. And I guess this was around 2006, something like that, or 2007, 2007, I think. And I just researched animals, 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 animals. And I, I re- remember really wanting green anoles. I, I wanted a bearded dragon. And eventually I had a friend who said, oh, you should get a crested gecko because the, my, my sister works at, her sister worked at a, a chain pet store and she had a crested gecko. And he was telling me that, you know, they don't need to eat crickets. They don't need to eat bugs. It's just a, a powder. And at this time, even Rapashi and Pangea were very small. I'm not even sure Pangea was a thing yet. It, Maybe it was, but it was definitely not popular. I couldn't find any Crested Gecko uh, meal replacement powder in the city I lived in. But anyway, I scoured the internet and the classifieds until I eventually found uh, a kid who was maybe like a couple years older than me, and he was saving up to buy a car, and he sold me an Exoterra 18 by 18 by 24 with his Crested Gecko, who was two years old at the time, with some powdered food, all for $180. So I was like, oh, I'm going to take that. So I I went up and scooped that reptile, and I had this uh, Crested Gecko. So I named him Jackson. And I remember having to specifically order Crested Gecko powder online because I could not find it uh, in Manitoba. So I remember it was in 2007, the fall of 2007, when I bought this Crested Gecko. And the guy I bought it from just had the paper towel with kind of fake plants and everything like that, which was fine. But I really wanted to do this live plant sort of bioactive setup, which I ended up setting up within a couple months of having the gecko. And 
and since then he's been doing great. He's 13 years old now. He's he's doing awesome. Although last year he dropped his tail when I was moving. I had him for basically 10 years, and I think I put him in the car in, in his terrarium, and he just got scared and he dropped his tail, which I was kind of sad about. But he's doing fine. His tail heal or the you know the place where his tail was has healed up totally fine. And he is a gecko that I've essentially never handled. I'm I'm not a huge handler like some people. Some people love handling their animals, their reptiles or their pets, and I, and I just I just don't. I like watching them. I love watching them hunt. I love watching them interact with their environment. And uh, so basically, he hasn't been handled in 12 years. And now, if I feel like if I did try to handle him, he'd have a heart attack and die or something. So I wouldn't even risk it. But anyway, so that was the kind of the beginning of my re- introduction into the reptile hobby. And at this point, I guess I was in about grade 11, and I was really starting to think about what I was going to do in, in, in school, for in university. And I really wanted to get a degree in zoology because I knew that passion of animals was sort of deeply ingrained in my system. And I thought if I could have a job that worked with animals directly, I would really love that. So a couple of years later, I graduated from high school, and I started kind of pursuing this degree in bi- biology and Within a year, I basically failed at a university and uh, and got suspended for a full year because I was doing so bad at school. Looking back on it now, it's kind of funny, but at the time, I was pretty devastated. I, I, I guess I just obviously was not working nearly as hard as I should be. I mean, maybe you have some, some of you have had that experience where you come out of high school and you sort of breeze through high school and then you realize right away that you can't breeze through university. But I guess this is also a good point to Uh, sort of a good point to share my other passion which is swimming so during that whole childhood from six till basically I was 24 years old I was a competitive swimmer so that I would say swimming is my number one passion that's what I did all of my life and put all of my sort of blood sweat and tears into and I was swimming at the university as well so obviously I had to take a break from from that being suspended from school but anyway Swimming is what over overrode everything else. It was the most important thing in my life. And so I took the year off of school and, and kind of had to just train on my own type thing in, in the water. But eventually I got back to school and started training again. And then I sort of shifted my focus away from the biology and towards anthropology. Anthropology I did really love as well. And it was a little bit easier of a degree to get because I didn't have to do as many labs. I did get a minor in, in biology, in, in plant biology. But because my major wasn't in a science it was a little bit easier to get sorry if that offends anybody that has an arts degree but this allowed me to continue to pursue swimming as well as a degree and anthropology is pretty close to biology in some sense because I really focused on human evolution and and things along those lines the physical anthropology side but the most important thing for me was that I was able to pursue swimming and uh, I ended up going on and I was a five-time medalist at our university championships, which is sort of like NCAAs, but nowhere near as high, just because our population is quite a bit smaller. And and I retired at, at Olympic trials in 2016, where I finished eighth. So now I coach swimming, but I can really now dive into my passion of animals as more of a this is the the podcast and the YouTube and the blog is less of a career, obviously, and more of a hobby. But it, it really allows me to kind of express this passion that I have for these animals. And uh, now that I have the time to do so, because I'm not training, you know, 25 hours a week. So during that time where all that was going on, where I was failing out of school and I got back into school and I finished my degree, I uh, still only had the one reptile. I only had Jackson, the crested gecko. And I remember it was the summer of 2015 and I had never interested. I wasn't interested in getting any more reptiles. I, I just liked having the one. He was very easy to care for. I liked watching him and that was good enough for me. But then I remember the summer of 2015, one of my teammates, one of the swimmers, also had a crested gecko and her and her family were going on a a vacation for like two or three weeks and they asked if I could take care of the gecko and I said of course so they brought the terrarium over and I set set the gecko up in uh, in the living room and throughout that week and a half or two weeks or however long they were gone for I realized wow caring for two animals is just as easy as caring for one and I really liked having a second animal so of course that got the wheels going in my brain like oh I should just get I should get another animal because I, I of course really love animals and now that I kind of realize I can manage having two, then I, I should definitely go and do it. So I spent days on Google researching things, and, and I ended up finding a giant day gecko as, as the, the pet that I wanted to get because I've always loved the way they, those looked. Now, finding it was a lot trickier than I originally intended it to be, but I ended up kind of pursuing that. So, But the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to build the, my own enclosure, and I really loved any of those pictures I see, I've seen on Google of people kind of converting cabinets or china cabinets into terrariums or vivariums. 
So I ended up doing that and I actually made one of the videos I made is actually just a slideshow on my YouTube channel. It's called DIY Chameleon Vivarium because I ended up using it or selling it for someone who used it as a chameleon. But it was originally built for my day gecko. And, and so if you want to see the process of how I did that, you can watch that video. But I kind of had a lot of fun building that project and working on it. And then and then after the project or after the terrarium or the vivarium was built, then then I was really tasked at trying to find an animal to put in it. And you have to remember, this is almost eight years after I bought the crested gecko. So there's an eight-year gap between the, my first two reptiles, which I think must be some kind of record because that, that's a long time to go before adding a second animal to your collection. But so, so what that meant is I had I was not involved in the hobby at all. Like I just cared for my crested gecko, but I, I was not involved with the breeders or, or understanding where to go or what are the best places to look. So when I started looking for this day gecko, I realized, wow, I, I can't find one. This is really, really tough to find. So, and at the time, I was really only into geckos. I'm not sure, I just, I just really loved geckos, but I wasn't interested in, in other things, especially snakes. I was not interested in snakes at all. But I had taken a picture of the vivarium that I built, the china cabinet that I converted to the vivarium, and I posted it on a bunch of different forums and just said like, hey, um, I built this vivarium with the intentions of putting a day gecko in it, but now I can't find a day gecko available. Does anyone have any ideas of something that they would throw in something in, in an enclosure like this? And you know, I got lots of different ideas, but then a couple of people suggested, oh, you could put an Amazon tree boa in there or a green tree python. It's about, you know, they were sort of an arboreal enclosure. And then again, the wheels start turning. And I think I start looking into Amazon tree boas and start looking into green, uh, green tree pythons. Like, wow, those are really, really cool. Of course, those are impossible to find in Canada as well, thankfully, because um, the ones that were available in Canada were extremely expensive, like hundreds of dollars, like five or $600 for an Amazon tree boa and well over $1,200 for a green tree python. So if those were easily accessible, I probably would have bought one and I didn't need to be spending that much money on one, but luckily they were not easily accessible. But that didn't stop the wheels from turning and the wheels kept turning but I ended up finding a, a day gecko and I found a breeder in Ontario which is the province to the east of, of Manitoba and they were going to the the local Manitoba Reptile Expo that we have in the fall so it was only about a month away so I contacted them and asked them if they would bring one of their day geckos uh, for me and they said they would and I ended up buying uh, a female day gecko at four years old it was literally the only one that I could find and I, I at first, I didn't really want to buy a gecko that was already four years old, but I ended up doing it anyway, and uh, I'm happy I did because she's awesome and and she's been a great gecko. But of course, just getting the bringing the day gecko home and putting her in closure that was awesome and exciting. But the wheels had already been turning because of those people telling me that I could get a snake, and like I said before, I wasn't interested in snakes, but all of a sudden I I was. I don't know what happened, but I started to become very interested in them. And this would have been in the fall, like November of I think November of sorry, October of 2015 is when I bought the gecko. And then by November 2015, I had my first boa constrictor. So there's only like a two or three week or maybe a four week period between me just wanting to get the second animal to me getting the third animal because I started going down this, uh, this snake path. And, and like I said, the Amazon tree boa and the green tree python were basically impossible to find. But then I started to get really amazed at boa constrictors and, and, you know, BCIs particularly because the BCCs are harder to find and uh, obviously more expensive. But I don't know what it was about boa constrictors, but something about them just, I was just really mesmerized by them. And, and I had not been interested in them before. I just started looking more and more into them. And, and I just loved the way they looked, the, the way their bodies looked and how, how much they moved around. And, and when you took them out, you could, you could, when you handled them, they didn't just sit there. They were, they were, they would slither around and explore and they're very in inquisitive. And, and they were like that in their terrariums as well. They spent a lot of a lot of times moving around in their terrarium. So this was really, I got to get a boa. And luckily there were a few boa breeders in the province that I live in. So I ended up finding one in, in 2015. In November, like I said, it's when I bought Winston. That was my first boa constrictor. So he's just a like a common boa, not a red tail. He's a BCI, so a boa constrictor imperator. Although I think the constrictor part of that scientific name has been dropped. So we just call him a boa imp imperator. And he is a half... Sonoran Desert Boa, half Colombian Boa. So his great grandparents or his great dam and great sire were, were both half Colombian, half Sonoran Desert Boa. So that's what he is he is from. And he's also Het Leopard, which doesn't really mean anything to me. I'm not, I'm not too concerned about morphs or anything like that. So he basically looks like a normal Boa, but he's relatively small. He's, he's uh, three years old now and he's only about, about four feet. And I don't anticipate him to get much more than five feet. But 
when I bought him, he was tiny. He was only 67 grams when I first got him because he's essentially a, a Central American boa, or at least he's half Central American, and they tend to be a little bit smaller. And even at 67 grams, I was still very afraid of him because I had not interacted with snakes before. And, and like I said, I'm not a huge handler of animals. I don't like physically handling them too much. I like, I'm a lot more about watching with my eyes, which I think might be unusual for someone in the reptile hobby. But even at 67 grams, which is hilarious when you look at it, because he's just tiny, I was still very unsure of myself with him. But I eventually got warmed up to him and and I was able to handle him when, when I needed to. And, and he, you know, grew from there. So then fast forward a few months from November 2015 to, gen, or to June 2016. And that's when I was it was early June 2016, and I was perusing through the local reptile classifieds, which I do on a very regular basis, as I'm sure you do. And I stumbled across this really horrid ad. This lady was selling a small boa constrictor at the, at the time. I don't. She didn't know basically any information about it. I think she said it was only a few months old. I later found out it was a year old, and it was very small for its size. But the in the ad, there were pictures of the boa, and I could see from the pictures that there was stuck shed all over the animal, flakes of shed skin on the floor. You could see that this animal was going through a horrible shed, and this boa was being kept in a exoterra terrarium, and it was a 18 by 18 by 24, so it was an arboreal terrarium, so there's just like a very small footprint of space for this animal to be in. No heat. It had no supplemental heat. And she was feeding it, I think it was it was something bizarre, like she was overfeeding it and underfeeding it at the same time. She was feeding it like four or five small, like pinky or fuzzy mice uh, or fuzzy rats a week or something like that. It was just, it was absurd. And, and she was asking, I think like $200 for this thing. And, and I ended up telling her like, no one's going to pay this to you. Like you should just give this animal to me. Uh, this animal's going to die. And we went back and forth and she got very offended, of course, because I, I think she thought I was attacking her, but was really the point I was making was that you you don't know how to take care of this animal and you're proving it with your standard of care and so she I think she ended up just telling me oh well, okay you can come pick it up because she really just wanted to get it out of the house and I did end up giving her sixty dollars for the animal because she gave me a few other things like a couple hides and and uh, a heat bulb which she wasn't using although obviously you wouldn't necessarily want to use a heat bulb for a boa anyway so I gave her the sixty dollars and and I thanked her for for letting me come take the animal and so I set this animal up and I did some research and luckily Manitoba is a pretty small community, especially in the reptile hobby. And I was able to sort of track down the lineage of this animal. And uh, I found that it was about a year old and or a little over a year old. And I had found siblings of this animal that were twice as big being cared for people who actually understood how to care for animals. So I, I remember talking to someone who had the sibling of the same litter that was 200 grams and the animal that I had was only 100. So there was some definitely some malnourishment going on. But anyway, that's the story of how I acquired my second boa constrictor, and that, that was uh, a snake I, I named Whip. And over that year, it took me a while. She's, I still feel like she's not 100%, even though it's two year, a full basically two years later. She eats well. She poops well. There's, there's nothing physically abnormal about her. She just doesn't seem to put on muscle as easy as my other animal like she's always a little bit more flaccid and and that might be just her temperament but but I do I do find that she doesn't put on weight as easy and I do blame a lot of that on her first year which was just horrible she basically would have died probably in a few months if I had left her in that condition and then fast forward another year and a half into the fall of 2017 and that's when I picked up my Brazilian rainbow boa so the the boa this Brazilian rainbow boa was bred by a breeder in Manitoba and a really nice guy and he you know, took very good care of his animals. And so she was about two years old when I first got her. And she's been a great animal ever since. I had no issues with her at all. So that's how I got my third animal. And then, so my collection is only five animals. I don't have a giant reptile collection. Part of me envies people that have a large animal collection. And I think maybe one day my collection will grow a little bit. But for right now, five is definitely more than enough. I do a lot of traveling. Being a swim coach, I'm, I'm traveling all the time. And, and I don't necessarily want to have a whole zoo of animals that I, I have, have to be tended to when I'm away and I also I, I think it's really important that people don't bite off more than they can chew like I think sometimes people have these not everybody but some people's collections grow because they want to have the next biggest collection they want to be this person that has you know 40 animals or so and and the, sometimes the care can start to dwindle when you have that many species so I think it's really important to have the amount of animals that you can care for 
and provide very good care for. Like I, I have, there's people on YouTube who have 20 or 30 animals and provide excellent care for them. But then there's also people who have the same amount or even less and don't, can't provide as good care because it is actually pretty expensive if you're caring for that man, amount of animals. So I think at one point in, in my future, I'd pick up a few more, but for now I'm happy with five. Definitely on my wish list, I have an Amazon tree boa and a green tree python for sure. I see that in my future. And I don't know what else. I, I'm really happy with the animals that I have. And I, I really want to eventually build them large display enclosures, almost like a zoo style display enclosure. So if you go to my YouTube channel now, you'll see what they're in. And as they grow to their sort of adult size, I'd like to have something a lot more brilliant for them to be in. And if that's my plan, obviously, I can't have a room full of animals. So anyway, I think this is kind of where I'm going to start to wrap up this episode of the podcast because I do think that kind of provides you guys with enough background information of who I am and the animals that I own and I hope sparks or at least shows you how interested I am and how, how engaged I am with, with, like for me, learning about animals is the most exciting thing. Not necessarily owning and having them, but learning and talking to people that, that have animals or study animals or in the field, that is what really gets me excited and I hope that I can con convey that through some of these podcast episodes and hopefully this kind of provided enough framework for you guys to see sort of where I'm coming from. And I, I do have a very specific philosophy that guides my care and, and the philosophy is basically the better the care, the more your animal is going to display their fascinating natural behaviors. Now I didn't, I didn't make that quote up, I read it somewhere and I think I paraphrased it in some way. I can't remember where I saw it, but I think it perfectly wraps up the way everybody should care for their animals because it is so important. And I think that's where the divide comes between the people that study wild animals or conserve wildlife and people in the hobby is not everybody in the hobby does a great job of caring for their animals. And sometimes people don't like to admit it, but there's a lot of bad care out there. And I'm not suggesting I have the gold standard of care, but I do really always want to be pushing people to push the limits of their care to increase the standard of their care. And I'm not just talking about reptiles here. I'm talking about all animals. I go into much further detail about my philosophy in the, in the video I have posted. It's called I don't think reptiles should be kept as pets, question mark. And I'll probably actually convert that to a podcast episode as well. It's only about 15 or 16 minutes long. That way you can listen to it on just audio if you want because there's really nothing visual happening in the video. But it does break down my philosophy a lot more. And again, the, the video is about reptiles, but it does, but really it, it, it is for all animals, whether that be fish, reptiles, mammals, it doesn't matter. My philosophy will be the same regardless of the animal species. So if you are more interested in listening or to learning more about my philosophy, then definitely go check that video out because it breaks it down in much further detail. You know, my philosophy is very important to me and that's exactly why I donate a portion of the profits that I make from the YouTube channel, the blog, as well as the podcast to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And I also sell shirts on my website and $5 for every shirt gets donated directly to that charity. So what this charity does, it's a local Canadian charity. They go to Peru and with the donations, they buy chunks of the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. And what, what that does is it protects it from being illegally mined on or forest or deforested. And they're essentially protecting those precious wildlife sanctuaries from being totally destroyed. So that's what I'm doing to try to bridge this gap. And, and that's really what this podcast is about and what my channel is about. It's not about me saying I have the best care, look at all my animals. It's about trying to use this passion that we all have for animals and and help animals both in the hobby side by promoting better care and in the wild side by conserving land and learning more about the species. I think that is really, really important. So I think for now, I'm going to leave it at that. That's uh, enough for this episode. I'm, I'm surprised if anyone made it this deep into this episode because this is a lot of personal history about myself that's maybe not necessarily that interesting, but I did think it's important to sort of lay the foundation of who I am and why this podcast exists. So if you're an animal lover and you want to learn more about animals, both on, on sort of all spectrums, whether that's the hobbyist side or the native uh, wildlife side, definitely join me. I can't wait until we get into the interviews so we can all learn together. But for now, this is the end of the episode. Make sure you subscribe to me on YouTube and visit my blog at animalsathome.ca and we'll talk to you later.